Hello everybody, I am Jehi from TU Vienna. This is a presentation for our accepted paper, De Bastille, From English Requirements to Signal Temporal Logic. Now, let's start with a short story to motivate our work. Suppose Alice and Bob are colleagues in an industrial company. Alice is a verification engineer, and Bob is a machine learning expert. Alice one day complains that she is frustrated by the resistance of her colleagues to use formal methods in practice. Maybe it is difficult to learn, she says. But more importantly, it is not easy to translate natural language into formal specifications. Bob is a little curious about what the specification looks like. Alice then takes signal temporal logic as an example. This is widely used in subphysical systems. Alice says, it looks like this like this, and this. Bob is baffled by the complex symbols. It seems to require a lot of mass. I know why engineers are reluctant to use formal methods, he says. Then, Bob suggests to Alice maybe it is a good idea to build a translator to directly translate English into formal specifications. Alice admits she has considered the possibility before. But she finds that traditional approaches tend to require strict rules for the input. But in fact, English is quite flexible. Then Bob asks, why not consider deep learning? OK, now the story ends. Let's return to our work. We built an NL2 STL translator. The input is English requirement, and its output is an STL formula. However, if deep learning is adopted, the biggest problem is lack of training data. Hence, we developed a training data generator that can automatically generate a parallel corpus. This is our most prominent contribution in this paper for further supporting deep learning-based research in this field. In order to develop such a translator, we firstly conducted an empirical study for both STL and English requirements in literature. Then, based on the data obtained in the first step, we developed a dataset generator Finally, we employed a state-of-art AI model to train the translator and evaluated its performance. Before formally moving to these three parts, let's first we look at the real results output from our translator. These results are all correctly translated. The first example size, wherever V mode is detected to be zero, please look at here. Then at the time starting at after at most 100 time units, uh, look here. This signal should continuously remain on zero. I look at here for at least 20 time units here. So eventually means something will be true at a certain time in the future. And always means a certain property should keep true without interruption for some period of time. The second requirement size, when signal web becomes 40, signal SD should be five at a time in the future within this time interval. And before this, the value of signal S4 should keep within this range all the time. For the third example, the translator is designed to be able to accept synonymous English utterances as shown in the slide and output the same STL formula. OK, then let's go step by step to say how this translator is built. The first step is empirical analysis. We start with an analyzing a template distribution of STL formulas. The first represents invariance or reachability properties. Instead of an always keyword from our tool, invariance is formally denoted as a G operator. For reachability, we use an F operator to express the meaning of eventually. The second is immediate response, which means once the precondition is satisfied, then the postcondition must be true immediately. In this template, Phi and Psi are called atomic propositions which do not include any temporal operators like G or F. Comparing to immediate response, the third category is called temporal response because in this template, the precondition and the postcondition may include temporal operators. The last category includes nested temporal phrases that represent stabilization and recurrence properties, respectively. As shown in the red figure, the four categories are nearly evenly distributed. Next, we studied the frequency distribution of STL operators. The results show huge discrepancies. 
For example, for arithmetic operators, we find that equality is used more often. This is because equality can also be used to check if a discrete variable is in a given mode. We also find that future operators are used much more often than past operators. This may be because most specifications have a natural future flavor. Except as to formulas, we also consider the statistics of English requirements. The first observation is the sparse and unbalanced nature of the language usage habit. We find some acceptable utterances that do not appear in literature. Next, we evaluated the language quality, which is divided into groups of clear, indirect, and ambiguous sentences. Based on the empirical statistics, we then move to the second step, corporate construction. Our basic idea is to first generate an STL formula randomly, and then translate it into several English sentences. So the initial question is, how to generate an STL formula? Obviously, we need to define STL grammar for generation. Unlike its recursively mathematical definition, here we take an inverse the bottom to up approach. We firstly define a grammar of simple phrases at the bottom layer, which include the arithmetic relations of atomic propositions, their negation, rising and falling edges, and their building combinations. Then we move up to define the layer for temporal phrases with different variants. Here, TP prime is a syntax sugar. It can represent unary temporal operators with one atomic proposition or binary operators associated with two atomic propositions. Then moving up, we reach the layer of nested temporal phrases with a combination of F and G operators. Finally, with an auxiliary component P, we can assemble the three defined layers to obtain the four template categories identified in empirical analysis. Through assigning different probabilities to selecting different syntactical components, we can sample an STL formula with a weighted manner. Here is an example to show how a formula is generated. Clearly, this formula belongs to the temporal response template. Here, we illustrate how the post condition gets generated. For the grammar of template response, the post condition should be a temporal phrase. Then we go to the corresponding layer, selecting TP prime, which means assertion. Next, we select the temporal operator. Here, we choose unary operators. In this group, we randomly pick F operator. And meanwhile, we also generate the time duration I. Afterwards, we need to decide what to represent the atomic proposition alpha in this temporal phrase. So we go to the bottom layer and select the first item. Finally, we pick the smaller arithmetic operator and randomly generate the signal name and the corresponding value to replace x and u in the grammar. This restricted grammar is designed as a balance between generality and simplicity. So from the figure below, we can see it can nearly support all templates of the first two simpler categories. However, for the latter two categories, the grammar can only support a portion of them. Since we can control the probabilities for selecting each branch in the grammar, finally, the frequency distribution of STL operators in our generated corpus is largely consistent with the empirical statistics. When an STL formula is generated, the next step is to translate it into multiple English sentences. Here we use the post condition in the above example to show how the translation of atomic propositions are processed. Generally, the translation procedure can be divided into a handler and a translator. There are two pipelines in the handler. In the upper part, the first pipeline will randomly generate an STL fragment as described before. It received the type of the syntactical component as the instruction. Here it is an event representing a rising edge. Then all the information of the generated post condition is stored in a Python dictionary called generation information. The second pipeline, shown in the lower part, will generate adverbial information and the commands specially used to operate predicates. They receive the positional information of the STL fragment as input. Since the post condition is after the implication symbol, the position is a string denoted as after imply. 
The positional information will trigger corresponding translation instruction, which will decide whether to add adverbial modifiers in the translation. In our example, obviously we need them. Then the handler will retrieve related adverbial information in the program database. For example, here we can use the adverb immediately or the adverbial phrase at once. Then again, the predicate commands will also be retrieved in the database with the insertion of the adverbs collected just now. For example, with the modification of adverb immediately, we can use simple future tense or use modal verbs like should for translation. Next, two outputs of the handler, namely the generation information and the predicate commands, are sent to the template refiner. In this module, row translation template will be retrieved according to the index in the generation information. Then we can use the string in the ingredient field of generation information to replace underlined placeholders in the subject and the object parts of the row template. Similarly, we can use the predicate commands to refine the row predicates provided. Finally, we can obtain the refined subject, predicate, and the object as shown in this slide. The next step is to assemble the refined template into complete English sentences. Here we select the right part for illustration. Let's go to the translator, where the examiner will do the assembling job with the adverbial information. The six translations use predicate will increasable. The assembler will also place adverbial modifiers in the beginning and the end of the sentence, as shown in sentence 3 to 6. The second six sentences use predicate should increasable. Now we have overall 12 translations. Since we only select a quarter of the combinations in the refrain template, finally we can have a total of 48 translations, from which we can also randomly sample a designated number as the final output. After moving up, we need to organize translations for temporal phrases. However, as shown in the right figure, the procedure is much more complicated. For the x-axis, we need to consider different temporal operators. For the y-axis, we need to consider different variants of each temporal operator. For the z-axis, we should consider the English tenses that are suitable to express each temporal operator. Even when we fix one combination of the three aspects, we should also consider the position of the temporal phrase because it is related to the reuse of predicates. But luckily, we can reuse the translation of atomic propositions with the addition of temporal adverbial modifiers and the enrichment of verb tenses. This is the general strategy. Now we reach the last step, namely machine translation. We firstly consider the 6 to 6 architecture. This is the most fundamental model in neural translation. The general concept is to divide the whole procedure into one encoder and one decoder. The encoder reads the input English requirement, and the decoder generates the corresponding STL formula. Each symbol is called a token, and it is represented as a vector. During the decoding phase, the decoder actually adopts a probabilistic approach. For every step, the probability of outputting each token is based on the output of the encoder and all the decoded tokens in the last steps. Then, we can multiply all these series of conditional probabilities as the confidence of the translation, as shown in this formula. A more advanced architecture is seek to seek model augmented with attention mechanism. In this model, for decoding a specific token, the decoder will also calculate how much attention should be paid to each encoder output, and synthesize a vector representing the obtained attention information, then integrate this vector into the condition part when computing the probability of each decoded token. Then, we come to the state-of-art architecture, which is called transformer. It drops the use of recurrent neural network because it hinders parallel computing. Then, apart from encoder-decoder attention, Transformer also introduced a self-attention by calculating attentional information only within the encoder and decoder, and multi-head attention, which could integrate the attention information from multiple factors. Given this, we adopt Transformer for our deep STL translator. Except the AI models, one specific problem when translating STL formulas 
is that identifiers and constants can be arbitrarily designated. Therefore, we cannot use a vocabulary with a fixed size to cover all possibilities. Our idea to solve this problem is to split each identifier and constant by inserting a value space between each character or digit. In this way, we only need to use characters or digits to represent identifiers and constants. For recognizing numbers, it's simple because using regular expression can do this job. But for recognition of identifiers, it is not that easy because identifiers can be non-meaningful permutations of characters or complete English words. For testing, we simply use the lookup table method to recognize non-English word identifiers because in our dataset, we do not use English words for identifiers. After the split of identifiers and constants, the input sequence will be encoded into tokens and sent to the neural network. Then, remotely, the output tokens will also be decoded to finish translation. In the raw translation, the identifiers and the constants are still split. We then adopt a maximum match method to recognize them and make them look compact. We can also extract the template of the output formula by replacing the atomic proposition with a string called phi. Based on the translation, we could calculate some accuracy metrics. In the first example, the output mistranslates 4 into 6, and since there are 11 tokens, the formula accuracy is 10 11th. However, the reference templates and the output templates are completely consistent, so the template accuracy is 1. Normally, the template accuracy would be larger than formula accuracy because it masks possible errors when translating atomic propositions. We will use formula accuracy as an indicator of convergence during training. This slide shows the validation loss and accuracy in training. All three models can converge at last with different rates. For testing, we firstly tested the three models on synthetic data. The accuracies of seq to seq are very low. However, for attention seq to seq and the transformer, their accuracies are pretty high, with the transformer performing a little bit better. However, when we did extrapolation tests on 14 English requirements collected, the translation accuracies of all models dropped considerably. Despite the loss of performance, we can see transformer still does the best job. Next, we will demonstrate three translation results on extrapolation. Unlike the testing cases shown in the introduction part, where the English requirements are similar in the training set, this time, the testing cases are from the real world, and we will say all models would probably make mistakes. In the first example, we can see transformer translates correctly. However, the attention seek to seek model fails to copy the identifiers and the number, and even mistranslates the greater than relation into smaller. The seek to seek model performs very badly. It tends to generate lengthy symbols without explicit meaning. The numbers of CT, CA, and CS roughly denote the logarithmic value of output confidence. In example 2, transformer tends to add a rest operator before the atomic proposition wrapped inside an F operator, while attention seek to seek model would reverse the original meaning by adding a negation operator in front of the corresponding temporal phrase. Still, seek to seek performs very badly. In example 3, Transformer translates the requirement correctly, while attention seek to seek makes the same mistake. As illustrated from the testing results, we can find that the strength of deep learning approach is that it can achieve very good translation performance when the testing data is similar to what have been trained. However, once the testing data is very different from the training data, its extrapolation performance is very poor. This problem is not that obvious in general learning tasks such as translating between natural language because there is a huge amount of training data. But when it comes to specific domain with small training data, the overfitting problem becomes very prominent. We we'll leave the solution to this problem as a future work, which have been discussed in detail in the discussion section of our paper. Here we only list the separate directions. 
Thank you very much for your attention.